Bert, welcome. I'm going to get emotional, Ron. Are you ready? Oh, I'm sure I will. Just, just go ahead and go. Let yourself go. You know this is like a big deal for me. Is that right? A hundred percent. Look, there are people from Tampa in this room who are who are geeked out as much as I am because we grew up listening to you. You defined our comedic sensibility just as much as Bill Murray, as 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 Rodney Dangerfield. You were the guy that we listened to driving to school if our parents were cool, if our uncles got a DUI or whatever. And, 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 and I'm the DUI guy? That's That's my... That was your demographic. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's not too far off. That was, that was one ugly demographic I had. Um, but that's that's actually very cool. And I yeah. hear that from people from Florida from time to time. Because that was... Uh, well, let me just say, from the average listener that I had there, you went too far with it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you... <laughs> you... Like, everyone's like, oh, Bert, this is crazy. I'm like, that's every gig I ever did in my life in Florida. Yeah. <laughs> It's really it. It's really it. But, you know, I'm honored as well that you came here today and you left your shirt on. So let's hear it for him. Everybody. Yeah, thank you. That's Florida for you right yeah. there. That's Florida's take your shirt off. You remember those Bucks games where they're yeah. like, all right, we're going to make a law that you ha your shirt has to be on in them. Yeah. That's Florida. Here was always the worst thing at a Bucks game, too. Everybody would have, all the men would have their shirts on. Then it would be that 15 minute rain back into heat. Yeah. So you're in a huge 80,000 people steam bath and it stinks like dirt. Oh. And no one mentioned No oh. one mentioned it. No Just one brought it up. Aggressive BO. Yeah. Well, the other thing about that area that did you grow up there? Grew is, up in Tampa. Yeah. Is a lot of people, you know. Of course, retire, go to Florida, but a lot of people just drop out early and go to Florida. Yeah, that is the essence of the of the the what we now know is a Florida man. Right. Like, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not even fucking around. Our dudes we went to high school with are now a Florida man. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's a Hillsborough County uh, Sheriff's Office site where you can find out the arrest records. All of my, I mean. All of my friends from high school are a Florida man. My uncles were a Florida man. And like yeah. every I it's it's hard to get out of there without being a Florida man. Yeah. And you always have that a Florida man in your head where you do stupid shit. Like yeah. like attack someone with a weed whacker and you're like, What? I grew up in Florida. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean but that was like, you know, I, I I say this candidly. Growing up in Florida, you have a different sensibility. I remember we used to have this big uh, scavenger hunt. It was one day a Jesuit where we all went to, had to go to church for two hours on Friday. That's all we had to do. So Thursday night, we all got hammered into a scavenger hunt. And everyone came back with a, this guy pulled a gun on me story. <laughs> Fritz Casper's yeah. in the front seat. Blake Casper, who now owns all the McDonald's and Tampa's in the front seat, going, pull the trigger, motherfucker. <laughs> and, and we're on Bayshore. And we're on Bayshore, taking a left on Bayshore. We're at that light. on, uh, And we're going to take a left on Bayshore. And Fritz is looking at him going at the light letting it turn red and he's like the guy's gonna run out he's gonna jump in the car he's gonna run out he's gonna run out and as soon as the guy opens the door to run out Fritz punches it his car stalls and he's like oh shit ring, 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 <laughs> and kicks it back in the guy jumps on our car on Bayshore gun in his hand on the side of the car swing at us and I'm, I'm just thinking that's childhood <laughs> yeah right it's true yeah it's true it's not even a story you could tell at thanksgiving it just happens all the time there oh everyone yeah. pulled a gun on everyone has guns yeah and it was that i think that explains your sensibility when you go back to florida you and your friends and i'm I, this is gonna sound sullen but either dead in rehab clean or just still fucking around and just getting their fifth dui yeah you're like you're like god damn it man this was my this was my loins this, yeah. these are the loins i came out of yes you know it was always funny when i did radio down there and we go out and do gigs and you would shake hands with people the amount of people missing a digit it's <laughs> unbelievable like every third and fourth person is missing a finger yeah <laughs> oh, oh, oh. But, I want to I go back <laughs> Yeah I know I feel the same I never was as comfortable yeah. As I was there But you were a ball player too You never bring that up much You were You were a ball player when you were young. Yeah I played uh, 
I played my whole life in Forest Hills, then moved to went to Jesuit because of the baseball team. It was the first time humiliated, humiliated, humility ever hit me was not making the team my freshman or sophomore year and playing JV and being like, God, but I was good. But we were everyone we played was so yeah. good. There's kids from Jesuit in here right now. Our pitcher was a guy named Brad Radke who went pro, mm -hmm. and I was his catcher. And because I was his catcher, I got recruited too. And so uh, I remember I got an off. I got offers from the Citadel, uh, from Duke, and and then Coach Crumbly was like, "If you go to Florida State, that you can walk on." Right. And I mean, I mean, I think any one of us, our our goal was Florida State or Florida. That was it. It was Florida State or Florida. No one went to UCF or USF at the time. And uh, and I got into Florida State, and I was like, that's it. I'm walking on the baseball team. Walked on my first day, uh, met the coach. Uh, I remember he didn't even call me by my name, and he was like, yeah, 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 yeah. He's like, hey, you're not you're not the best guy out here, but you can go catch bullpen. And I was like, I remember thinking, and he's like, and you're going to quit your fraternity because the party is not partying is not going to do anything for you. And I remember thinking, I'm going to trade baseball for partying. <laughs> I, I'm being dead serious. I was like, I'm much I'm much better at partying than I am baseball. Yeah. <laughs> And who wants to blow out their knees catching bullpen for four years? And his son, Mike, uh, whatever, whatever, I forget his name, but his son was the catcher. He went up, played, went on to play for the Expos. But uh, and I just, I literally, I, le I, I mean, this is, I really regret this, but I just, I left my bag and I walked out the left field gate and I went to Sally Hall and I got high. <laughs> and I've never played baseball since. <laughs> By the way, this is the thing that you're laughing would be a sad, sad story anywhere else, wouldn't it? Yeah. It would be like this, this would be like, oh my god, it's so sad, and everyone's yeah. just like, good. I walked in. I walked in. I had yeah. cleats on. Yeah. And Mike, you remember this, but like <laughs> Chili Willie, Chili Willie, Paul, uh, Paul, uh, Chandler. They we used to black out the rooms, and they'd poke holes in the thing so you could see. It looked like stars were in there, and we get high, and we call it time travel, and we just lay. <laughs> And just get high and stare at the yeah. scar stars. And it was like, you were like, holy shit. And I walked in the room. They were doing that. I still had my baseball clothes. And I was like, <laughs> give me a hit. I'm going with you guys. <laughs> and we laid on our backs and time traveled. <laughs> still had the uni on. Still had the uni on. <laughs> <laughs> That's the funniest shit. Yeah. But of course... When you're an adult, you're like, oh, the poor kid. But at the time, I would have cheered you on. Oh, at the time, yeah. it just made so much sense. I was mm. like, because I, I, I remember, and this will speak to my comedy, when I was a kid playing with Brad Radke, he pitched for the Twins. He was could have was arguably could have won a Cy Young Award one year. Watching him play when we were kids, our dads would go, just look at him. It's effortless. And it was. It yeah. was. He did everything so great. And I remember my dad saying, like, when you find your thing like that, that's when you know what you'll have. And the first time I did stand-up comedy, I remember I called my dad and I said, I found my thing like Radke. And he was like, well, then you got to go after it. And I was, but that watching those guys play, it was just it was always harder for me. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, first of all, the, the people, the, the kids in Florida, the baseballs that are hot. Like, you could be driving down the road, pull over. Uh, you know, buy some hot fish to some guys cooking on a fucking screen grill and sit and watch high school, high school kids. I'm like, this is amazing. Oh, you know? It was hardcore. Our yeah. high school was like, baseball was the thing. And, yeah. and, uh, and our football team was okay, but man, baseball, I played winter ball and summer ball. I played baseball all year round my whole life. And when I stopped, it was like this weird sense of mourning. Like I couldn't play uh, intramural softball. It depressed me. Sure, of course. And uh, I couldn't watch baseball. It depressed me. And I was like, uh, it's just dead to me. And I just stopped altogether. But uh, I've, I've since sung like the things at the baseball games. And it's, I love baseball now. Well, yeah, it's just as good. Yeah. What you did. <laughs> 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 now when we're doing i mean by the time this plays it'll be time for your special but yes. you know before this it's the series and then election which once again is in florida's hands so dude let's do like give me your, your both predictions on world series and the election and we'll see it come if it comes true i think it's gonna be cubs and hillary it's gotta be <laughs> Cubs and Hillary. I was on my first my first TV show. My first TV show I was on. Uh, they were like uh, talking about the election, and I, I kind of was embracing this meathead in me, and I was like, yeah. I'm not fucking voting. I'm not voting. My votes. Vote, your vote doesn't count. Your vote doesn't count. Besides, I'm a write-in vote from Florida. Who's gonna count that one? And it was the Bush election. Yeah. 
and literally they I could not look like a bigger ass. They're like, your actual vote might have fucking counted. <laughs> I mean, like, just bold. My vote to rip my shirt off. My vote to fucking count. Oh. We'd actually have actual time travel now if you would have voted. Yeah. Everything would have been different. Yeah. That's funny, though, that you, you talk about that thing about being a natural, right? And for comedy for you, you're one of those people that you didn't write material even when you walk walked up on stage the first time you yeah. just walked up yeah the first time i did stand up was uh at pop bellies in tallahassee a radio show had heard i've I'd been written up in rolling stone magazine as the number one party animal in the country uh again that should be sad yeah, but, yeah. it really should be he walked away in his uniform and got hot that should make us sad Oh, end of the perfect movie. It I really is. Everything responsible in my life, and I win. <laughs> That's like a flip flop scenario of the high school teacher who wants to go back into the pros and start pitching in the backyard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Rolling Stone discovered me and called me the number one party animal in the country, and it was like a six and a half page article. It changed my life. It really changed my life. And uh, and in the article, I said I wanted to be a comedian. So this radio station put on a live event. Uh, four comics. One comic who's, uh, he's not doing comedy as much, but he's out in LA. His name's Christian Harloff. He actually gave me the best advice of my entire life that night. But I had no material. I just was like, I got a few ideas. I'll wing it. And it was sold out. It was packed. And uh, right before I went on stage, I grabbed a beer. I grabbed a, a, a Natty Light, or a, I think it was a Natty Light. And um, Christian Harloff said, don't do that. And I said, why? He said, because you're already a party guy, but like, if you do this drunk, you're going to have to do it drunk the rest of your life. And he said, do it sober. See if you like it sober. And if you can do it sober, then you can do that sober for the rest of your life. You don't want that in your life. And I put the beer down and I didn't bring it on stage and I did it stone sober. And I, I for what I could remember, I killed. I did really well. Wait the a minute. You were sober and had a blackout? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. It was, it, yes. The first time. I called it gray out. So, so I, the radio station offered me my own morning show. And they were like, they came up to me and they're like, we want you to do your own morning show. I, by the way, not because I was talented on stage, but I also was this number one party animal in Rolling Stone magazine. And, and they said, you'll be third mic. And then this guy's going to leave in a month. And then it'll be your show. And I sat with a guy at Potbelly's in the far right corner of the table outside and i said so we're gonna be working together and he was like yeah he's like for a month and i was like how cool is this and he's like mm. and i was like i was like why why would you leave and he was like who the fuck wants to live in tallahassee <laughs> <laughs> and I, it was like i could see it like like a beautiful mind just written right in front of me who the fuck wants to live in tallahassee i was like me either i guess <laughs> The, the, uh, funny, the funny thing is you just were there for six years for school. Six or well, seven, really. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I spent, by the, I was in college longer than grunge music was around. <laughs> he shot himself in my second junior year. <laughs> so and so I, I said, where are you going? And he said, New York. And I said, I'm going to, I'm going to New York. And this guy who now works at Kimmel uh, had done this piece on me. And I, I, I taped that set. I sent it. To him, he sent it to a guy named Jason Steinberg, who most comics know. And uh, Jason Steinberg said, I think you're funny. Move to New York. I'll try to help you. And I called my dad and I said, I'm moving to New York. And so I moved to New York based on that one set. Well, that's um, that, seemed, that impulsiveness has always played a big part of your life, right? Just Yeah. Oh, yeah. impulse. We, I, we actually, this is something we, I talk about in therapy. I am a man of impulse. Like, like to a flaw, like, mm -hmm. like b biggest problem with me. I, I love, I love when someone just, it's like eight in the morning and someone just goes, you want to get drunk? <laughs> and you're like, fuck yes. Like, I love that feel. I love the roll of the dice of like, Hey, like, uh, like. 
like, uh, hey, I got edibles. And you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, I'm being dead serious. When, when like, my 21st birth, first birthday, I had anxiety because it was planned out. You're supposed to get drunk. You're, it's expected of you. I don't like that. I can't do that. Like, even, like, eating shows. Like, I'll go in hungry, but I get there and I get, like, nervous and I can't eat. But the impulse of ordering three meals and sampling them, like, by yourself. I did that the other day at Bear Burger. I got, like, three burgers and then sampled them and took a picture of the healthy one and put it on Instagram. And, <laughs> and But I, I'm a man of impulse and, and that's bit me in the ass because I've said yes to stuff that like TV shows where I do dangerous shit and I go what the f I've, I've woken up full blown panic attacks throwing up in bathtubs calling my wife going I've made a lot of really bad decisions I never made any decisions sober and I just I just literally was like I'll fucking do it I, <laughs> and, I, and that's the way I live my life and I have had many like I could give you I could name easily five times i've been in a shower on my knees praying to god crying going why the fuck do i why can't i just be like a regular person but well real quick do you think that god's in the shower is that uh <laughs> why is that this you know they have churches i've always prayed in the shower god is going what i can't God's like, why are you talking to me now? Closing his eyes. I know I made it, but what did you do to it? Oh. So the shower is your I pray, prayer I'll, spot. I'll pray tomorrow morning in the shower. Yeah. I will, I will, because I'll fly. I always say, I do rituals. I wash my entire body. I leave the soap on. I scratch down like a catcher, and I say a prayer. And then I visualize myself getting to the place safely. And then I say a prayer for my family, and I go, we're fine. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, do you wash the soap off or uh, after that? But okay, I, have, I have it all over my body. It's got my body's got to be covered. So I'm a little obsessive and compulsive too, by the way. Yeah. Should note that out. I, <laughs> a man of impulse with obsessive compulsive is not fun. I uh, I just feel bad you weren't there to tell Buddy Holly how to keep the plane in the air, <laughs> scrub down, kneel like a and say prayers. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah. Uh, By the way, kneeling like a catcher is not in any religion yeah. in the world. <laughs> Drop down like someone's stealing second. <laughs> Coming down. Oh. Oh. Uh, oh. You know, I, I I was telling you this before. I've you talk about being impulsive, but you're. I watched you on Periscope for. A, a long time and they would just come up at the oddest times yeah sometimes you're in a phenomenal great mood and other times you're just really down and on the road and missing home but I, that, can i that's the thing i don't understand like okay i like the the bet i've said this to you but my favorite interview you've ever done was with that kid from national treasure it was real it was so if you don't know the interview the kid comes in hot and he's being kind of a dick and ronnie just beats and says no fuck you leave we're not doing it and the kid apologizes he goes i'm really sorry i messed up can we start this over and, and ron's like i don't know it's the great i can tell you where i was when i listen to it it is my favorite thing because it was real i like real real respects real and, and so i've always looked at social media as like i do not get this propaganda driven cult of personality that some of them take on and my friends my friends you know and i'll name them dane kevin amy they all they all have this thing where they can't show you their flaws sometimes because maybe people attack i don't know so i've always had this thing like fuck it show them every part even the even the scabby parts and the dirty parts and i had one time where i was spiraling out of control and i was like fuck this i'm fat as fuck and fucked and i'm like losing my shit and the two worst people in the world for me to watch it tom segura and ronnie b <laughs> <laughs> I don't know they're watching me spin. Out. I'm like, look at this fat fucking stomach. Uh, these jeans are tight. My 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 pubic hairs are stretching on my legs. I'm fuck, I'm drinking a vodka and I murder a vodka. And yeah. these two, you just had these tiny airplane bottles all over your room <laughs> in my man cave. Yeah. <laughs> and these two, and then I'm like, and then I and then I have a normal life. <laughs> like five days later, they call me and they're like, we're worried about you. <laughs> I was like, wait, you don't have those moments? And Sakura was like, I do. I don't share them with 9,000 people. It's a, it is completely like what, like, I wish I could fix that in me, but it's part of the thing that, like, 
I like taking big swings. I like big gulps. I like living large, and I'm vulnerable. And I and so I saw so I cry on planes a lot, and like that just happens. <laughs> like just a movie will catch me wrong, yeah. And I'll I have to throw the sunglasses on, or a song will come on, like Bachman Turner Overdrive. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> dun dun. And I'm like fuck. That's right. I got a lot of life to live, and sunglasses are on. Double Jameson's down, yeah. and I'm like. We're gonna think, put on some Joe Walsh, Rocky Mountain Way, we got this. I, I do have a theory that people are way more emotional on an airplane than anywhere else, man. Dude, walking tall with The Rock, <laughs> when he rips his shirt open, he goes, this will never happen to anyone else in this town. And he's got the scars. I am sobbing uncontrollably. <laughs> and I was like, you, my man, made your way into my heart for the rest of my life. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hope you you parallel out of this out of this this wrestling thing and really keep making movies. I watch The Rock's Instagram all the time. Yeah. I, before I go to uh, CrossFit, I'll watch The Rock and I'll just watch him work out. I'll be like, "That's right, we can do this, Rock." <laughs> There's no doubt that one of you can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one of you has got it. Yeah, one of us definitely does. <laughs> but this this is the thing. There is, there is something about you that everybody admires. Have some water. Everybody, uh, you just killed the water real fast. Impulse. I, who makes these baby ones? What are we doing? Murder those. <laughs> but you go around treating the world as if they're friends first, right? I mean, look, it seems like everywhere you go, somebody would love to have a beer with the machine. Yeah. And unlike most people of your stature, you're willing to do it, it seems like. It's a flaw. Yeah. It's a definite flaw. Yeah. It's a, I think it's an intimacy thing, but like I, I, uh, I, you know, I, one of the thing, one of the biggest moments of my career, this is going to sound silly, but, um, I am, when I moved to New York, the guy that I was like, mother, you could bring this guy with any of my friends. And my friends would think he's the funniest human being in the world was David tell. And I wanted more than anything to get drunk with David tell. That was like, I'm talking it went get drunk with David Tell, get a deal, get on Letterman, like, and so I got my opportunity. He was sick. We were in Miami. I just had George and my oldest daughter. This was twelve years ago in June, and uh, and he was sick and he just didn't feel like drinking the whole week. And then on Sunday night, he ponied up and he was like, "Fuck it, let's do it. Tonight's your night. Let's do it." And I and it meant so much to me that he took the time to compromise his antibiotics. <laughs> and go out with me and it, and he got swarmed like I've never seen anything like this and the second we went out everyone was around him everyone's buying him shots and he's just passing them to me he'd get two birds take one and I felt like I felt like I was made of gold it was my favorite night I went I just had a kid I just had a kid and I literally forgot to call home and be like how's the baby I was <laughs> yeah. it was the most meaningful thing in my life and I and I and it's, not really the baby, <laughs> drinking with a tell. All drinking right. with David. I mean, I just met this baby. I had yeah. known a tell for eight oh, good years. Point. Good point. And the, and the baby didn't talk. You've heard Dave. Yeah. He's funny. Like, yeah. So, <laughs> and so, uh, and so, in a weird way, like when I hear people say, "Like, dude, it's my dream to have a beer with a machine." I get, I go, no, I know what that feels like. That's my biggest fault. I'm a, I'm a fan first. I'm a comic second. Like, I'm a fan of podcasts, your radio show. I can, t I, I can tell you intimately shows you've done that I've listened to. My, one of my favorite Ron and Fez ever, 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 ever was I'm on, I'm on uh, La Cienega with my wife, and I go, oh, Ronnie B's on. You're going to love Ron and Fez. And I turn it on, and it's 15 seconds of silence. <laughs> <laughs> And then slowly you hear a man crying. <laughs> and my wife looks at me and she goes, you like this? And then you hear Ron go, come on, Fezzi. And he's like, Ronnie! <laughs> By the way, any for us fans, yeah. that is radio fucking gold. You're not going anywhere. You're not getting out of your car. You're taking the long way home and you hope there's traffic. You know what's and funny though? We gave you so much of it. <laughs> 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 that I don't know what gold was worth anymore. But that's my problem is I'm a fan first, so I get it when like when someone says I want to have a I want to do a shot with a machine. It, it's hard. I turn them down now, I, or I do fireball. But like I'll uh, be like compromise. Yeah, Good. which I think is giving me diabetes. But like, but I want to have that. I want them to feel like I'm accessible and and. And you know, it's like I have friends who are like, like Seguro is not that guy. No. He is not. He's like, no, I get off stage. I go to the green room. I go home and I go to sleep. He's like, if I drink, I just buy myself in my room. I'm not hanging with people. And I was like, yeah, but 
Like, I don't know why. Why did you get into it? Like, that's my theory. Doug Benson will get high with everyone. And then, you know, like, I like that. I don't know. It's like we were walking through a, a mall in Southern California one time. My whole family and these kids saw me at a Dave and Buster's and they're like, holy shit, it's a machine. And I was like, what's up? And they're like, dude, we got to do a shot with a machine. I was like, of course. So we go over. It's like, it's like noon. My kids want to go on the carousel. <laughs> And I go over and I do a shot with them and they're like, this, this is the greatest day of our lives. And I was like, thank, uh, thank you for saying that. And then my wife's just sitting with my kids like, what the fuck are you doing? And I was like, it's my life. Yeah. But that is your balance, right? You really are. Because again, I see this from Periscope. You go home, the kids are, you guys are in the pool and you're yeah. running around and they get who you are. You don't hide that aspect from them not at all I, I mean and you know for all the the stories you hear about my drinking i'm pretty even killed at home I've, i often don't drink at home only because i've got to get up with the i go to crossfit at 6 a.m and then i go take the girls to school when i get home from crossfit and and i like to get stuff done i like to have a, an active day i also like drinking if it drinking shows up it'll happen but it's not like uh i don't think it's as bad as people would imagine and i'm a, i am an okay dad. My wife's a much better mom than I am dad. Sure, that's true across the board for everybody. Yeah, yeah, like I'm, like if you, for the average person, you're like, that guy's phoning it in. But, uh, but yeah, like I, I'm a pretty hands-on dad. I like being a dad. I like being a dad better than a husband. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> Up to one point, it was so sweet, wasn't it? <laughs> but, but you know, I, I respect you for saying that because when a lot of, a lot of guys will say they're nervous about being a dad. I'll just go, oh, you're going to be bad at it. You know yeah. what I mean? You're going to be bad. I don't oh. know if the motherhood gene, like they have that gene. I don't know if the fatherhood oh. is that natural to us. So uh, I'm on the road the whole first year of George's life. Um, and Colin Quinn's tough crowd was my thing. I watched that. When I got home, I'd Monday morning, my wife would sleep in. I'd sit with the, with Georgia, our youngest, and I'd watch Tough Crowd and the repeats of The Chappelle Show. It was it was perfect. I was on the road. I'd have coffee, and I felt like I wasn't – oh, this is going to sound fucking horrible. I felt like I wasn't connecting with Georgia, and I was kind of freaking me out. So I'm like, is it because I'm gone? Like, the kid just doesn't get it. My wife says, no, it's because I breastfeed her. So I was like, one morning, I'm like, I wonder if I can get her to latch on. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so, so, and this is an attempt to be a, to connect with my daughter, of right? Of course, of course. So I, I very, very casually offer the, t offer the tit to her and she goes for it and I mean, hooks in like a wrestling move, like it's jujitsu, just gong, and I can't get her off. You've got to pry them off with a fucking finger and I'm going, help, help. And my wife comes in, she's like, what the fuck are you doing? And I'm like, I wanted to connect with her. <laughs> but I, and I didn't, I really honestly did not connect with my daughters until they were like two, both of them, yeah. both of them. I did not connect with them until they were two. And I think now I have a really close relationship uh, with both of them. But it is this weird, like I disappear for a week, for weeks at, at an, on end, and then you come home, and I sometimes they say shit like, "I feel like I don't have a dad." And you're like, "Ah, oh, fuck!" Like, what about that? Like, there's no way to rationalize. There's guys that go to Iraq for two years, and that th this is a job. This is what we do. I didn't see my dad all the time either. But then you just feel like a, you, that's when I feel like I'm like, uh, you feel like a shitty dad and sometimes. But you know? do you ever remind them that you uh, took them to Dave and Buster's and then did fireballs with some? <laughs> whacked out kids i try to bring it up to them <laughs> but I, that I, that is true right you that's the thing of you are away yeah you're away that's i said to my dad one time very recently i said i do feel like a shitty dad because of this and he's like no 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 this is what you pick to do you pick to do this, this is what you do that's it there's nothing you can't think about it in any other way and he's like listen he's like do you remember seeing me during the weeks and i was like and i don't really i mean my dad would go to work he'd be at work before i w went to school I'd see him maybe he was in a marathon. So on the weekends, he'd run 10 miles on Saturday. I don't know. I'd, I'd have a catch with him, but I didn't really like hang out with my dad. But things have changed so much now that it's like, if you're not like a super hands-on dad, you're a shitty dad. And when you're a road comic, I remember Chris Hardwick said, why would you ever have kids if this is your life? And I was like, I don't, I don't know. Like I had kids. That, Points. Yeah. yeah Points. Yeah. <laughs> uh, deductibles, man. Come on. But see, here's the, and, and I will... I, I totally get where your dad is coming from that because I only remember my dad on his vacations more than anything 
else, but is it? But you know who spends more time is divorce dads. Like divorce yes. dads yes. will do anything to be around their kids. Dude, uh, J- uh, uh, Jason Ellis yeah. is divorced from his. I'm mean, not to call out Jason, but he's a friend of mine. I don't think he would matter. He's just, and I see him having the greatest time with his kids. And then when they're gone, they're with their mom, and he gets to live his life. And I went, right. damn it, man, divorce doesn't. If it didn't fuck the kid up, I might be into that. <laughs> I'll, I know this. I never saw my dad on a bumper car in his life, but divorce dads are like, what do you want to do this weekend? Yeah, I got the kid. <laughs> yeah. I, I got the kid, but I sleep because I'm home <laughs> for two days. Yeah. Like, divorce dads really murdered his dads. Yeah. And it was funny because that used to be the stereotype of bad dads, and now they're they're murdering it, and us <laughs> regular dads are just taking a bath in fucking <laughs> misery. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, I'm. 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 I think that's the other thing is that I'm a very regular. I get like people do my. I do my podcast out of my man cave, and I'm saying eight out of ten comics will go, dude. It's so cool to see like a, a, a version of a comic that's a regular person because like I am a regular, very regular. Like my house isn't is it's expensive, but also only because it's in L.A. But it's not like a mansion. I got two dogs, a rescue cat, and my kids are running around in my own merchandise shirts and <laughs> and my wife's like my wife's like a like a solid seven you know <laughs> and so <laughs> i mean she's getting older she was a nine when i met her but like she's a, <laughs> no but my wife knows i love her and she's cool like stanhope came to my house to do a podcast this is like i just want by my, the way you could lose your kids just for that happening yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, this is one of the. And by the way, fan first. I've been reading Doug Stanhope's blog on his website since I started comedy. So when Doug says he wants to do my podcast, it's a big deal for me. I'm like, fuck yeah, I love. He's a, he's one of the greatest comic voices of our generation. I, he doesn't even call me. I just open my front door because I hear something, and he's sitting on one of my Adirondacks, coming in hot. He had been doing coke with Marilyn Manson all night, and he's just, and he had just gone to Bill Burr's house, and he didn't feel it went well, and he's just like, I could use a vodka, and I'm like, fuck yeah. Me and him start drinking. We drink for probably four hours straight. My kids come home, and they come out, and they're like, Doug, would you like to have dinner with us? And my wife's like, did you guys just invite Doug Stanhope to have dinner with us? And Doug's like, fucking definitely. So me. Doug Stanhope, my kids and my wife have dinner, and 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 I saw, you know, we all see the party side of Doug, but you see the regular side of Doug, yeah. him fucking around with kids, and we've all got that. And it was like, for him, it was cool to be like, have a home-cooked meal with a family. And when he got done, he was like, that was, thank you for inviting me. That was so cool. And then we did another podcast, like two more hours of podcast, and just kept drinking and smoking and smoking cigars, and he's smoking cigarettes, and it was just great. And it was like, in that moment, we connected. Like, we really connected for friends forever. We'll always be friends because, I don't know, it was like, it was like this regular... And we both got that hard, road hard, party, get down, it's late night, after hours club personality. But, you know, it was, I don't know, it was a really neat, neat moment to have in life. But yeah, I'm a regular dad. I'm a regular dude. I'm not like a celebrity or anything. Well, you don't, you don't set yourself up for it. You don't treat yourself no. like you're one. You know, you, no. you walk into places like you're ready to buy a ticket. It's, it's kind of a rare thing because normally as soon as anyone gets any kind of VIP treatment, that's all they expect oh, forever. I, I went to Fleetwood's a big restaurant in Maui and like I just I just kept calling going, Hey, I'm famous. Can I get a good table? <laughs> and they're like, Excuse me? And I was like, I'm I'm famous, I'm on TV. Like, no, I don't think people on TV really do that. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I don't think Ted Danson ever <laughs> That. But then we got there and they gave us a VIP place and the guys like and the guys that ran it was like, hey, I listen to your podcast and they gave us like Mick Fleetwood's table and we ate in the corner and I was like, shit, they really think I'm fucking famous. And my wife's like, you are. I've been on TV for seven years. Like, <laughs> like maybe you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you got the special coming out, which. You kind of even waited a while before. Well, I got, I mean, very candidly, I got caught up in Travel Channel for seven years. Mm -hmm. I did a special in 2009, started working for Travel Channel when I was 36, and I'm 40, I'm turning 44. I've been there the whole time. And they book you so that you cannot, I mean, they, and they, it's good because they're paying you, but they book you out for a year. I mean, you're booked. I was doing two shows at one time. And, uh, and I never had the chance. I would just do stand-up to get by to keep fresh. And I never had the opportunity to do a special. And then finally I was like, I just told them, I was like, I need to take a break. I got to stop. I got I need to do this special. I'm a comic first. And, and I fell off a waterfall and fucked my back up. And, uh, and the, when I, I posted it online and 
all the comments you'd think they would be like get well soon or something and they were like hey man we don't watch your stupid fucking show like stop <laughs> putting your life in danger just do comedy that's all we fucking care about your podcast and comedy stop with the tv everyone bill burr and rogan said the same thing they're like hey man we haven't really watched your show we don't know if it's good but you are a really good comic you should you need to do an hour and you need to focus on stand-up and, and and when you start hearing that enough you're like i need to really like i need to be doing a special every 18 months i need to be on the road i can do tv but it needs to be on comedy's terms not the other way around and so uh and so this special has been a long time coming, and I had the, this machine story that I I feel like I had to tell. I feel like a lot. I feel like everyone knows it, mm -hmm. but there's still millions of people that have never heard it, and so I felt like I wanted to get it out there because I also want to stop telling it. That's the last time. The special is no, the last no, no, time. No, no, no. <laughs> Ronnie, if you know nothing about me, I can't let anybody down. Everyone's like, stop telling it. One kid in the front's like, can you tell it one more time? When I was yeah. 22, I got involved with the Russian mafia. <laughs> but it's still a fun story for you to tell. I mean, you're still, I mean, you're holding court with that story because it's so insane. It, it, it's, uh, it is, uh, it is, you know, it's kind of, it starts to become a separate entity and you don't, almost don't even connect to it anymore. Like I'll, kids from my class, for those of you that don't know, I've, I robbed a train full of my classmates in Russia with the Russian mafia. I, I just feel like for those people that don't know, that was a spoiler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the machine. And so, <laughs> and so uh, kids from my class that I robbed will come to my shows and they'll sit in the front row. And it always is, it's always like, because you, you, you know, when you tell a story as a comic, it's laughter first, facts second. But I've, I've tried to stay very true to the facts in this story because there are people that were involved. And if they, if I ever get called a liar in the story, it'll fucking destroy it. And so kids have come, in, uh, come to my shows that I robbed and I always bring them on stage with a shot of vodka and I go, so fact check that, what part of that isn't real? And they're like, it's a hundred percent true. And you just do a shot of vodka and I'm always like... I fucking told you. <laughs> it's it's it is it is the one of the greatest. It's the greatest story that ever has ever happened to me. Yeah, well, it's uh, and that's going to be a big part of the special. I close on that. But I watched you because you periscoped it, and I saw you backstage before your special. You looked as chill as possible. You had the stool that you had written. Yeah, I, I wrote. I wrote all my because uh, oh, you always want to have a set list when you're doing a special, just so you don't miss anything. And at least if you miss it, then you can go back and go, oh, let's cover that. And so I thought instead of having a piece of paper, what I'll do is I'll buy a stool. Of course, I bought four stools, <laughs> and then I wrote my hour special on the stool. I wrote it like real pretty. I took some time to do it, and then I had my daughters write me notes, and I wrote myself notes like remember your eyes, um, slow down. Because I can rush through things. And so it was like a reminder. And I wrote it on two stools. And for each show, I used a different stool for different sets. And then I was like, and then I was like, ah, oh, if the special gets really big, I'll auction them off to St. Jude's and say they can make money. And then I was like, fuck that. I'm going to keep them. Yeah. <laughs> now, why do you write Remember Your Eyes? Sometimes you forget forget uh, your eyes? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have very expressive eyes. Uh -huh. And, uh, and, and I'm not, I'm not like a, there's a couple jokes where like, like for instance, when I say I am the machine, I don't think that line's funny per se, but if I dart my eyes left, right, left, and then pop center, it gets a laugh. And it sounds so <laughs> silly, but just things you pick up in doing stand up, you know? And then, um, and then, so like, like it just, I'm not going to do it cause it won't, but I'm like, uh, uh, whatever the fucking line is, uh, I'd. I get to his door and everything he said. I'm, I'm, I can feel myself doing it. I literally, I knock on his door and I'm, I meet a guy, a real Russian guy's room, wife beater, tracksuit, tattoo, cigarettes, and he just stares me up and down and goes "sto." And I panic and everything. I want why this and everything I plan on saying flood out of my head. And all I said to him in his doorway was, "I am the machine." And like I go back and forth. It's like, but and so I gotta pop my eyes. And if I pop my eyes, I get to laugh. I don't know why. I, another thing when I go to the Korean school, like I do this thing where I go like this, like to point to them with my eyes, and it gets a big laugh. And so I don't ever want to bail on that in these jokes. But I don't want to be at eye heavy. So if I yeah. just see it every now and then, I go, "Oh, that's right. Throw your eyes in there." <laughs> I like the fact that you don't want to be too eye heavy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I don't want to be known as one of those comedians. <laughs> You were also working a documentary, and then I didn't hear much about it since. Is there a plan for it? Uh, I don't know. It, you know, it was a big mistake. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I love those guys, and it was, a, it was a really cool experience. I mean, the shit we got. I mean, we have Hannibal Burris 
in one of the rarest forms you'll ever see this man. Like, just, we're all in Amsterdam, and he's just, Wah! I mean, <laughs> it is a badass documentary, but uh, it, it happened at a time in my life that I was going through something with a friend, and the way they covered it would not look so good upon this friend, and I think they need money to make sure that there's no lawsuit from this friend, and uh, who's not a friend anymore. And, um, and, and we said we were going to split it three ways and then they wanted more money because uh, for because they'd spent more money and it just got really bad and it and it, and then i just was like whatever I, I was like do whatever you want with it and i, I don't know what's going on with it I've, I've talked to them about it and i was like just i because it's so good it's a really i wanted to make a documentary about what it was like to be an unknown comic and what that that experience was like and and the day we started was the day I told the machine story to Joe Rogan on his podcast, and it changed my life. I mean, it changed my life to the point where I remember going, our first shut date we did was Columbus, and people called into the radio station going, the machine! And I went on stage, and the whole crowd was chanting the machine, and I was like, hey, podcasting had just blown up. And I was like, I guess I'm not an unknown comic. I just turned a corner. And so the documentary really is a person dealing with everything happening at the same time, and then all that happened, and, and me and a friend uh, had a, di a dispute that was uh, aired live on podcasts, and uh, and that was all in it. And it was like all the things that happen to you when you start to get success, and all relationships falling apart, and me being on the road away from my kids because I'm all of a sudden uh, travel channels got me working everywhere. I've already got stand up commitments, and it's a really fascinating documentary. Um, but I don't know if it'll ever air. I, ho I hope it does. All because of just business stuff, no, not just, any of the creative. Just business. Ideas. I mean, the documentary is great. We've screened it. People loved it. Um, but I think you need to have like you need to have like some sort of insurance policy in case people want to sue you because it's not. I mean, trust me, it's not an unsuable documentary. Like it's, <laughs> it's a litigious documentary. It's real. It's a documentary, yeah. and it's a documentary about a comic who lives out there and kind of lives big swings, and 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 and, and so. I think they wanted to cover themselves. I think also the split. I was like, whatever you guys want to make, I don't give a shit. I don't. It's not about the money. It's about this product that fans supported and paid for, and them getting to see it. I want them to see it. But uh, and I also don't want to fuck up. I mean, the guy's Jay Moore. I don't want to fuck up his career. I don't want it to look bad on him. But it just happened that we were making this documentary when Jay and I stopped being friends, and it doesn't look good. I mean, it just doesn't look good for either of us. Like, and so uh, is Jay in the documentary too? He is not. No, he's not. Uh, but but he is in spirit <laughs> he's definitely, so you guys aren't buddies anymore i haven't talked to him in like uh five years six years since that yeah is it something you would like to do though no no i mean i i think if i wanted to do it i'd do it i don't have anything against him and, I, and if i ran into him i'd be cool uh but you know that was a really tough period for me yeah, I was like, uh, and I'm very candidly. I started going to therapy because of it. Of Jay? Yeah, yeah. Because it was a he was a mentor to me. He was like my he was my guy, you know. Like, and uh, and then it, f it fell apart in like the ugliest fucking way. And I didn't do anything wrong. And uh, and and I can say that I've been to enough therapy to say I didn't do anything wrong. And 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 then you at a certain point you kind of have to go. Hey, well, if you're gonna lose a friendship over something you didn't do that you had nothing to do with it was out of your control then you need to let that go and and barry has reached out to me and said you need to you and jay need to be friends again and part of me says he seems very happy and i i am very happy and the last time we spoke we were not happy mm -hmm. so maybe we just need it to run its course and we'll we'll meet up again in, in another point in our lives may i there was no be repairing the friendship while i was on travel channel i was only home for like two days a month and so uh so maybe, I don't know. I don't have anything against him and I don't hate him and I don't want anything bad to come his way. I have nothing but fond memories about our friendship. The guy took me on the road and was, I learned how to do radio because of him. I learned yeah. so much about this business from him. He was, and he was a, he was a, you know, for the bad portions versus the good portions, the good always outweighed the bad. But I'm a very different man than I was when we stopped being friends. And I don't know if uh candidly if if we could be friends the man i am today you know i, I never told him i drank mm. he was sober and he didn't want me drinking and i just I, i'm not gonna stop fucking drinking 
I'm like, you can be sober. I'm, you're the one with the problem, not me. But I didn't drink in front of him. And, and that was something that always bothered me. I never told him that I drank. He knew that I drank, but we just never talked about it. And it's like, that just is so fucking, I really regret that. There's a lot of shit I did wrong in this relationship. I'm not saying it's Jay's fault at all. There was a lot I did wrong. But that was, you know, I'm a very different man today than I was when we stopped being friends. So, who knows? Uh, did I miss something? Are you and Jay gay for each other? What the hell did I miss? <laughs> What the hell? <laughs> what did I miss? We, we, he definitely, we watched a gay porn together one time. <laughs> he, he bought it, he bought it in my room as a joke going, oh, this is going to be on your bill. And then we watched this dude suck another's dick and neither of us could turn it off. We were like, we were like, fuck. And by, and by turn it off, he means their erections. Yeah. <laughs> we turned it off and we got hard. <laughs> and then, <laughs> Yeah, like, but like times like that, I fucking giggle of just how much fun we had. Well, I don't really even know your beef, but I'm like shocked that you had to go to therapy because well, it was this. a very public beef. Yeah, it was online, and so you, I got attacked from one side, I got praised from another, and it was just, it was just shitty. And uh, and you know, it's like losing a friend is hard. Like when you lose oh, yeah. a friend, that's like getting broken up with. And and it wasn't like it wasn't like hey we should stop it was like you're a fucking piece of shit you're a garbage you'll have no friends and like it was bad and then mm -hmm. I was like I was like fuck and so yeah and, and the, uh, therapy's not bad it just helps you figure out your head I can't imagine your therapist going all right explain to me again who Jay Moore is and uh... <laughs> my therapist I yeah. told him I said you gotta listen to these two podcasts. <laughs> It, it sounds so fucking weird. Listen to there's a, th a a thing on Reddit. Read that. Check out this story. Because I was like I was like I was like I need to know my fault in this because I yeah. I couldn't see it. And I go, you need to do everything. You need to do the work like a fan and don't. And I'll, I'll still pay you, but you need to tell me where I was wrong in here. And 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 he like listen to Marin's podcast. I mean he and by the way he he's like all of a sudden he's like I'm a fucking fan of Jay Moore's. Like, <laughs> <laughs> he's like that guy does amazing impressions. Oh yeah, he's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> and so and so, uh, and then at one point Joey Diaz called me. He's like, "Dog, fuck your therapist. We're having coffee every fucking morning." So I pulled out of therapy for a month and had Joey Diaz be my therapist. <laughs> and I fucking I got in shape. I lost weight. I felt good about myself. I stopped drinking. I was like, "Joey, you're fucking turning me around." Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you really are fucking impulsive, dude. Oh, you have no fucking idea. Yeah. So you're back in therapy now, though. You're. Yes, I'm always in therapy. I do yeah. it once a week. And what kind of stuff are you talking about? Is what... working out bits. Yeah. <laughs> Is this funny? Is this funny? Dude, I write down. If I say something funny, I write it down. Like, oh, I'm fucking using it. I'm paying 300 bucks an hour. I'm going to fucking use it. I don't, even, I don't even know what I pay an hour because my wife won't tell me because she said I'd stop going to therapy. Right. But uh, but it's great. I love it because like uh, – like a perfect example we're talking about the ego not ego i don't mean ego bad but like kevin hart and amy and dane have this thing about them where they can where they're not they're not fans first they're business people first they're artists first they're it's them and they're on a fucking oh, steamship and i just could not wrap my head around how come i don't have that like why don't i have why am i always humbled or why am i why can't i just be like yo yo what's up it's the mogul bird kreischer you know <laughs> I, I don't talk like that i don't no. believe that way and and uh, and so I was talking to my therapist about it. He's like, "You're an artist, create." And then I came up with that speedo campaign, and I yeah. was like, "I was like, fuck, that's what I do, man. I don't fucking promote myself. I just make shit. I write jokes. I make TV. I do. I have a sitcom coming that we're shooting. And I'm like, that's what I do. I let the work speak for. No, I'm not shitting on them. I'm saying for me, just create, and that's mm. that's all I do, and I love it. Now the speedo campaign, did that go anywhere? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> And you had your kids in the Speedo Dude, camp. Right? I wish you had been there because I literally said to them, I go, guys, it's funnier if you don't fuck around. If you're in the back just being normal, that's the funniest. And to their, t they, I did like three takes and they didn't screw around once. And it's so funny that they're, I'm doing this presentation to Speedo and my kids are just literally playing in the back in the pool, just screwing around. Like dad does this all the time. I do wear Speedos all the time. That doesn't freak them out. But it, but it went crazy. Like it went viral immediately. I'd never had anything I've done do that. And then I was like, shit. And then I started looking at all my old videos and I was like, ah, oh, my, my vlog was fun.
I was like, I'm just gonna, I have all the equipment. I have my own production studio in my man cave. I'll do this all I want. And then I was like, this is it. I'll focus on my podcast. I'll create TV shows that I want to do and I'll do stand up. And my, I'm like, right now, my next hour is better than this hour. Like, I'm like, I'm in love with the art form. I'm in love with this. I'm in love with the press. Doing opiate yesterday, some of the best radio I've ever done. I love that shit. I love this. This is like my dream come true is hanging out with you and talking about me. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, I'm not even sure if we're going to air this, but because uh, <laughs> I worry about lawsuits too. <laughs> no, but that is this really is your your job and what you do well, just coming out and being. And there's something that's so interesting about you because you're so incredibly comfortable, and then you're so uncomfortable at the same time. It's, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Gene Wilder had it, dude. That was the Gene Wilder thing, and, and even Woody Allen, where they could bring that to to places. Yeah, I I had a meeting one time in the, uh, with uh, the um, the Donner Party that Richard Donner made. Oh my God, Goonies. You want to call that's the Donner, I mean, it's party. Not the Donner Party? Why would they call it the Donner Party? <laughs> Jesus Christ! Why did I call it the fucking Donner Party? That's not something for that your therapist. Can, that cannot be the name of their company, the Donner Party. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit oh, I'm a fucking idiot When you said that I'm like in like in a Westworld way That you had a meeting With the Donner party I had a meeting with the Donner yeah. party I had a meeting with the Donner group <laughs> And uh, and they said to me They were like uh, They had they were like we had heard like a bunch of your stories and then uh, another story and i said oh, i didn't know that you knew that that was my story and they said of course the character's you and i was like wait what's my character and they're like I like politely you're like a regular guy that gets in over his head and isn't that bright and all of a sudden you're like fucking overwhelmed and you're involved with the mafia or you're and, and i'm like oh shit that is me like <laughs> my head i was like i yeah, i've gotten in over my head with impulse and being this comfortable uncomfortable got my whole freaking life it's like it with the mafia robbing a train i'm totally uncomfortable but here i am robbing a train that's like what confident guys do and it and, <laughs> and it just is a weird it is i i wish i knew what had happened to me as a child that created this uh because i do it to my kids <laughs> I think I'm a fun guy. I yeah. want to hang out with them. <laughs> but your kids look like they're having a ball too. A lot of people. I mean, they've been in and out of comedy clubs their yeah. whole lives, right? Yeah, I yeah. They've when they were little girls, they'd come and they'd sit in the green room, and my wife would get them in their pajamas, and then at the end of the show, they'd run up on stage with me, and I, and they've had the greatest comics in the world in and out of their backyard their whole child for the last four years, and uh, and they don't they don't see it any different, you know? Mm -hmm. Like they just kind of. I, I, you know, they're, they're, it's hard to make them laugh, but they're funny as shit. My youngest Isla is just, is literally like that kid is a walking bit. Like everything she does is a bit. And you're like, I'm literally like, I just, my wife will call me and go get your notebook. This happened today. And so, and they're just interesting little different people because of that. You know, I guess when your dad, when you don't have like a conventional household and you got a one dad who just, all he does is think of funny shit. That's all I do. That's yeah. my only job. When you become a comic, you change your brain. You literally say, I'm going to be different than everyone else. And everything's a joke. Everything at my grandmother's funeral, I'm crying. And my dad says, Hey, fucking stop it. And I go, what? And he's like, it's enough. We, we get it. <laughs> and I'm like, what? I go, what? He's like, he's, he's like, he's like, you're, ma you're making a scene. <laughs> and he's like, and I go, okay. And he's like, what are you, what are you crying about? And I go, are you, are you joking? And he like stands me up and him, my uncle pull me aside. And they're like, what are you crying so much about? Like, what, what's so sad? I go, my grandmother's dead. And they're like, yeah, we know that, but like, what about that is so sad? <laughs> and in my head, I'm like, this is gonna be a bit. This has got to be a bit. At some point, I can't figure out. So I'm too close to it. But I go, she's laying in a box, like, <laughs> and and then like an idiot, I go, she wasn't. She doesn't look like herself. She was so happy. And my dad's like, are you fucking retarded? <laughs> he goes, do you want her smiling in that box? <laughs> and then I was like, yeah, that would be weird if she was like, hey. <laughs> And they're like, hold it together. You're the head of this family. Hold it together. You cry and let everyone know they can try cry. We don't want that. Hold it together. And at the end, we'll, we'll all cry. And I went, okay. So we had the funeral. 
the women grabbed all the flowers and then my dad and my uncle grabbed me by the hand they walked me up to the casket this is so, like the and they just start crying like men like my mommy and i'm just like what the fuck is going on like, i'd rather you guys molest me in a closet than have this moment but even at a funeral i'm thinking of i'm writing jokes i'm like and and uh, and that's the way your brain is and when you got that for a dad there's no way that you're gonna not see things everything in a comedic light everything you know? your, d your dad comes up a lot in your stories always been close yeah we're really close he does i don't think i mean i, I think he likes me but i make him very uncomfortable mm. like really uncomfortable like i know he loves me i know he loves me i know he's proud of me but i know there are times where he's like god i wish you wouldn't fucking do that like he picked me up from one of my i do a call and sick to work tour where i do morning radio drink on radio go right to the club at one or at noon everyone calls in sick to work and they sell out everywhere it's, it's been probably the most successful thing i've ever done as a stand-up and uh i did tampa i did my buddy you know cowhead sure. mike calta i did my calta show i drank a lot of old fashions and yeah, i maybe miscalculated it by three <laughs> and literally blacked out halfway into my set don't remember anything don't remember how i ended the show i was told that i ended the show by going I'm not telling the machine story. I'm done doing stand-up tonight. And I walked off. <laughs> and then there are a hundred pictures of me obliterated with fan just, uh, and I'm sure I did probably 10 more shots after that. And my dad had to pick me up because I grew up in Tampa. And my dad's just standing there in, you know, golf shorts, penny loafers, no socks, and a, and a, and a collared shirt going, it's over. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go, like just really uncomfortable like that that's his son that, that that this is how his son makes 10 grand it's just <laughs> just like the elephant man gets hammered it's not 10 it's it's not 10 it's really five but but <laughs> and, so, and 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 i and you can just see you can see it in his eyes like he's the guy that he's like uh we have a glass of wine and then when you have a glass of wine he's like you're drinking it too fast <laughs> you know like i called him up this is uh, one of my favorite stories about my dad i called him up one morning so I was, sometimes I wake up at four in the morning with panic attacks because I have weird, crazy dreams. So I called my dad to talk to me. He goes, what are you doing awake? He's like, I thought you just slept till noon. I go, no, I had a bad dream. He's like, you still dream? <laughs> <laughs> and I go, like, real matter of fact, I go, yeah, of course I do. I go, you don't dream? He goes, no, I don't dream. I'm a man. <laughs> He's like, what do you dream about? Ponies and shit? <laughs> I was like, yeah. Yeah, I've had pony dreams. I have a lot of pony dreams. Yeah. But ponies he, and shit. He, ponies and shit. <laughs> but that's my dad. He's like yeah. he's a real man. Like, like, uh, yeah. He, I don't know. Yeah, I, I was. I'm very different. I'm a very different man than he is. But uh, but he called you the head of the family, which is not a lot of dads will do that. That's pretty amazing. Joey Diaz. This is a, a really interesting story. Joey Diaz slipped my dad marijuana Easter morning, a couple years ago. What do you mean he slipped it to him? Gave him a bag of okay. popcorn that my dad didn't know was marijuana. Okay. My dad takes two big handfuls. And then Joey's like, you're seeing the devil's dick tonight, Mr. K. <laughs> We're going deep, cocksucker. <laughs> it's Easter morning. <laughs> and I find this out. My sisters lose their shit. They're like, dad just ate edibles. And I'm like, holy shit. And I go, what do I do? And my little sister, Cotty's like, you got to go down there with him. Like, you eat edibles. And so I just go in and I eat edibles. And I go, dad, you ate marijuana. And he's like, no, but he's popcorn. And I was like, no, that's marijuana. And he's like, no. I go, yes. And you ate a lot. <laughs> I was like, this is going to get bad before it gets good. <laughs> And, uh, and we ended up doing a podcast. I was like, I didn't, I was the only thing I thought natural was to do a podcast. We do a podcast and then my dad's really fucking high and me and him sit out and we have a, we have like a, Jameson's our drink. We have a Jameson and a cigar, uh, a Padron 7,000 is my favorite cigar. And, uh, my dad like opens up, he goes, uh, can I tell you why you make me uncomfortable? And I'm like, I don't know if this is the conversation we should have right now. <laughs> And he's like, you remind me of my dad. Everyone likes you. You have a good time. You like to party. And you're always, every, you're, you're always, you're always there for everyone. You're always smiling and laughing. And my dad died when he was 42. And at the time, I was turning 42. And he's like, and it just, it, and I just see this is a death sentence. I see you're going to die this way. And I said, well, I'm, I'm pretty healthy. Like I'm, I can run and I can lift weights and I take care of myself. And I, and I, I and he goes, that's not it. I'm just not comfortable with it. And I said, what can I do? to let you feel more comfortable with me. He goes, 
I would like to get you a cardiologist that I approve. I would like you to get all the tests that I asked for to know that your heart's healthy. And so I said, fine. And so I went. He got me a cardiologist. I did a CT scan. I did a stress test. I did a full everything. And I had a very, like the health, 100% healthy heart, no blockage. And my dad was like, thanks. And I was like, we should have been eating marijuana together yeah. long ago. <laughs> and it was like a great moment where we got to share over marijuana. Thank God Joey Diaz slipped it to my dad, like Bill Cosby. <laughs> but the thing is, and I, I would tell your dad this. It's not going to be your heart. You're going to get shot to death. <laughs> That's the way you're going out. Dude, it's going to be a plane crash, shark attack. It's going to be something oh, no, big. No, 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 no. It won't be a plane. It won't be a plane because you're down, all soaked up, yeah. in the catcher's position, <laughs> taking care of things. Saying my prayers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's when I got my life insurance exam. I, uh, my recent one, uh, they said to me, they were like, uh, they were like, do you smoke? I said, no. Do you drink? I said, seldomly. And they were like, they were like, go through the whole thing. And then I go, you don't ask if I like, I'm going to swim with sharks a lot or anything. And they're like, let's wait. Do you? I go, yeah. <laughs> like I've been doing it once a month lately. And they're like, wait, <laughs> hold on. You swim with fucking sharks. And I was like, Oh, why would I offer this up? It's like, <laughs> Oh, I'm an idiot. Never mind. But yeah, it'll be a, it'll be something bizarre. When I die, I'm you ever cut your finger cutting onions. And then you go, motherfucker, just let me go back in time for three seconds. So I don't cut my finger. That'll be me when I die. God, damn it i really fucked up let me go back three seconds dude you know what i love is that we're gonna have this for after you die and i'll be able to play it that night and oh. i'll be like he knew my Bert knew my funeral is gonna be fucking awesome yeah there will be, i'm it's a fun roll i'm telling you right now <laughs> i there is not there's not, and I'm very luckily, there's not one thing I haven't done in my life that I want to do. I've lived out every bucket list adventure I could ever imagine on Travel Channel. I've spent seven years vacationing three weeks a month for the past seven. I've done everything. Jumped out of planes, jumped off the buildings, swam with great white sharks out of the cage and in the cage. I've done everything you want to do. There's, there's, I done, I've done more with this limited amount of skills and this little hair that I have that anyone, when I get to heaven, God's going to go, shut the fuck up. I didn't give you that much. How did you do it? Get out of here. How you, you said you could, how you did stand up? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Shut up. Yeah, it's going to be a fun funeral. Yeah. I just want everyone to cry and be drunk. Well, we will, but at the end with your dad. No one's going to do anything. <laughs> oh, my, we dad, my dad will be dead first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Hi. Bert Kreischer, everybody. The Machine. Friday, November 11th uh, at 10 o'clock. Thank you so much. Ronnie. I love you, kids. Seriously. Thank you, man. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.